you, Dr. Hopkins, for that wonderful lecture. And Dr. Clark, thank you for the invitation. My voice is a little lower than normal because I was in some of that suddenly cold weather back east, about a 40 degree drop in between a few other things kind of affected me, but we'll press on. Um, I am thankful, and Dr. Clark, you asked me to respond in terms of my musings as a psychologist, as well as my black church experience. So I respond in those ways. There's several things I wanna highlight from what you have shared with us this evening. The communal focus, the importance of social justice, perspectives on wealth, and the challenge. The communal focus, you noted that historically, the focus for African Americans to travel south, reconnect with family members and education, and to purchase as much land as possible. That was just not out of individual desire. It was about making our community better. My grandmother, who was born at the turn of the century, 1900, in Union, South Carolina, lived with us nine months out of the year, school principal and teacher. She always said, you need to do better so that the next generation can progress. It was always my individual achievement had nothing to do with me. It was about the community being better and stronger. At my beloved Howard University, what I learned, my discipline of psychology and my love of music and involvement of that, it was to enrich the community. So much so as I was at graduate school at Berkeley when I decided what physical disease I would study, I went to church, United Methodist Church, and a researcher in, on hypertension in blacks was speaking. And when I heard the critical problem, it was. My father had high blood pressure, but I didn't understand about that at that time. Then I decided I am going to study something that will be helpful to our people. Similarly, the focus on prostate cancer. Now, a lot of these diseases, there's the intersection of poverty, access to care, and a number of other factors. Just a little tidbit. My, both of my brothers went to the Naval Academy. Their prostate got checked from the age of 20. Now, typical screening guidelines are at 50. But if you have a family history, which many African-Americans do, it should be 40. But insurance will often not cover that. So some of the work that we did here in the churches, including West Angeles, but my church to Faithful Central Bible Church was to educate African-American men about this. So once again, the focus on the community, strengthening it, but also understanding how these things, the intersection of poverty in these dimensions. So then you highlight the importance of social justice. And Jesus is the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointing me to proclaim good news to the poor. In this, and also Dr. King's highlighting of the injustice of poverty and the importance of building wealth, I thought I'd look up a definition of social justice. Justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. Individuality gives way to the struggle for social justice. So it's distributing wealth opportunities. Some of us look at our wealth as just enhancing ourselves. I love the example you started out with, which takes us to a whole nother dimension. But the challenge is, as you said, our theology often doesn't really, it doesn't really encompass that. I was, you know, in, uh, I'm a PK. My father's a United Methodist preacher, goes back two generations. And I was in my late 30s in a Bible study, and I've been in many Bible studies, wonderful Bible studies, until I understood that, oh, heaven is not just after I die with eternal life. I am to have a redemptive influence on the world now. Now, I do understand that theological terms associated with this in terms of in partnership with God now, 
But think about that, what, what that means. I think often as black people, we do have our, the slavery, slavery a little bit is the by and by and, you know, when we get to heaven. And unfortunately, you know, get my inheritance now. Go for it now. Um, and I also think in, that, in a different church, United Methodist Church, where we had, church conf- had serious conflict in the church, I'm one of those evangelism people. Got to get people saved. A really very individual perspective, very important, but individualistic. Then we had those people in the church that I wonder whether they were Christians. That's kind of how I have been at times. Um, they were focused on social justice. And I thought, that's not, you know, that's not what the gospel really is. That was the most powerful thing. Then there were two other groups that I don't remember right now. Uh, But that was so powerful to understand all of this is the gospel. But we live and breathe and act as if that might not be true. Nelson Mandela said, poverty is not an accident. Like slavery and apartheid, it is man-made and can be removed by the actions of human beings. This is part of the war. This is part of the struggle. What is your motivation? You, um, perhaps in an earlier version of your talk, you talked about how uh, Dr. King giving his historic speech before the first mass meeting of the boycott, that he looked at the faces of people. He looked at the faces of the day laborers and the domestics. My question is, whose faces are we looking at? Whose faces inspire us to do what we don't feel in our humanity we have the ability to do? We need that inspiration of those who are here with us. In terms of vocation, you highlighted this briefly, but again, in an earlier talk, you mentioned about that the binding up the wounds of the physically broken and emotionally wounded, and also in terms of the word God, material resources and wealth to build a material reality. You highlighted that. And to speak truth to power. Do we really believe that's part of our vocation? Um, it, it is. There's a way I was, I was really please to hear how you were focusing on wealth. And if I'm honest, that first part was a little hard to take. It was like all this wealth stuff, wealth stuff, wealth stuff. Well, you know what? There's a way in which, especially, I don't know about you, but as an African-American, I need to be doused in that. I need to be doused in that. That's, that does not need to be a love language, as you said, but it needs to be a language I can ask access. So one way I'd approach this is how do you feel about money? Now, I'm a therapist and I do collect money directly from people. They hand it to me in a check. And I have to tell you, in training, that was especially hard. You know, they often gave it to people at the desk, but I knew people were paying for it. Then for me, have I, it's over $100 that I charge. You know, somehow that number, once you get over 100, it's a lot when you're at 50. But that's a lot of money to be asking for 50 minutes or an hour of therapy. Some people have no problem receiving money. What is your relationship with the money? What is your relationship in early asking about that? My I had the, uh, my father, it was like a game. They told us our job was to read. So during the summer, that's what we read, did, read, no jobs. So we got allowance, but get a little more money, I'd need to ask, you know, $10, $20. So it was like a game with my father. I needed to make a proposal. I had to provide a rationale. And when I'm teaching, was teaching my te- uh, students program administration and about applying for grants, I reflected on this. My orientation toward asking for money is that it's going to go well, it's even going to be fun, and it's a creative opportunity. And that might be why, for a period of my career, I was writing grants and, you know, relatively successful at them. I'm sharing that to ask you, what is your early experience related to asking for money? If it happens to be negative, like some of ours are, I encourage you to work through that work through that and move to the other side and understand that is for us as well. 
I'm just going to say a quick aside about some of my um, colleagues, actually, in my former institution, uh, University of Rochester, Ryan and Desi, have talked about happiness and human potential. And they talk about well-being and wealth and kind of maybe just basically make this distinction between hedonism, which we think about the pursuit of pleasure, and then eudaimonism, and it's not something I say often, so it's spelled in this weird way, E-U-D-A-I-M-O-N-I-S-M. So that has more to do a pursuit that's more connected to one's true nature, okay? Now, when people break this down, there's subjective well-being, which has dimensions like um, more individually focused life satisfaction, positive mood, absence of negative mood. Then the second dimension that's more focused on their true nature is related to psychological well-being. Well, that has individually focused things like autonomy, personal growth, self-acceptance, but it broadens a little bit to life purpose, mastery, and positive relatedness. Now, my critique of these dimensions are that they're not collective and communal enough. They're really not. Now, what insights do we have from black psychology? Now, I will give a disclaimer. Black psychology is broader than a Christian framework. But they're real helpful in, uh, points related to communal focus. Dr. Cheryl Gr Gr uh, uh, Grills has written about African-centered psychology strategies for psychological survival and wellness. She says African-centered psychology uh, recognizes that spirit permeates everything that is, that n the notion that everything in the universe is interconnected, the value that the collective is the most salient of existence. The collective is the most salient. And the idea that communal self-knowledge, communal self-knowledge, not individual, is the key to mental health. Amazing. There's a Houston Association of Black Psychologists, and they actually write in their appeal, if you are looking for a network of professionals with commitment to education, career development, and promoting the mental and economic wealth of African-American community, then Houston Association of Black Psychologists is for you. Your talk has really shifted my focus in terms of my own relationship related to wealth and the understanding about that. There's a way in which we distort that somewhat as a black community, maybe self-esteem stuff related consumeristic, you know, buying things that are high profile luxury kinds of items that gets kind of distorted somewhat. And we have every right to buy whatever we want to buy. But that is one way of thinking about using our money. But I think culturally, theologically, psychologically, a healthy approach would be first realizing the barriers and this legacy that is complicated, which you've alluded to. Knowing that we can be healed of that. Mm. And maybe the way in which wealth was supposed to be that God intended is for the betterment of the community and the world, yeah. not for me as an individual. Lord, may it be so. Mm -hmm.